Well, we're returning to our uh, series in the book of Hebrews. Uh, last week we looked at the beginning of chapter 1, and now we're going to look at the rest of that chapter. And uh, we have to remember as we approach um, this book, as we approach this passage, um, first and foremost, uh, it is all about God. Now, some people think of God. Uh, as being great and awesome and uh, impressive, uh, as unapproachable, uh, as important and set apart, uh, perfect, higher and better than we are, far above us. And other people think of God as being uh, near and close, kind and friendly, and loving and warm. Uh, knowable, approachable. I wonder what your perspective is on that. Well, the God of the Bible is both of those things. He is great, but he's also very near. Great and awesome and far above us beyond our understanding, uh, but he stoops down and speaks to us. He comes alongside us like a, a parent to a child, perhaps, and, and kneels and, and speaks with us, great as he is. We see that, don't we, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ is great, and he is very near. We call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And in him, uh, we are able to, to know uh, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. He's great. He's too great for us to comprehend, but, but we can know him. The God of the Bible is both these things. Because though he is great, he chooses to speak to us. And he speaks to us in a number of ways. We unpacked some of them last Sunday morning. Uh, he speaks to us through uh, creation. That is, everything that God has made uh, has one purpose. And that is to, to tell of his greatness. And so, uh, crashing waves uh, echo his voice. Great mountain ranges uh, point to the one who made them, who's greater than them. Uh, stars beyond count uh, speak of, of an infinite God. Uh, and we uh, enjoy the glory of the sunshine on us, uh, preparing us. Uh, to enjoy the glory of God. Uh, the uh, carefree birds will, will sing of his care towards them. Uh, the flowers uh, declare his beauty. Rain falls and uh, gives us a taste of the refreshment uh, that we can find in him, creation all speaks of his greatness. But he speaks not only through creation, which does give us an understanding of who he is, but uh, doesn't tell us perhaps clearly uh, who he is and, and what he has done. Uh, and so God speaks also through prophets. We read last week, God has spoken to our fathers by the prophets. Prophets uh, are people who speak, and they speak the words of God. God speaks through them. And we have the words of these prophets uh, recorded uh, in the Bible. The prophets specifically mentioned here are, are Old Testament prophets. And they spoke of all uh, that uh, God would do. They showed clearly who he is and, and how he would save his people. Uh, they spoke of, 
uh, how we were made in order to know God and to enjoy God. Uh, but they tell us that, that we have failed in that. And there's nothing we can do about it. But they tell us uh, of, of the mercy of God. Uh, the incomparable mercy of God, which is uh, greater than anything, greater uh, even than our sin. And they uh, tell us that uh, we need to be rescued. And that God himself would come and do that for us. So God speaks through creation, through prophets. But he also speaks, we're told here, through angels. Angels are creatures made by God to serve him. Uh, they're impressive, they're terrifying, glorious. Uh, whenever someone comes uh, into contact with them in the Bible, they're terrified. Uh, these uh, creatures are great creatures and they are essentially messengers uh, on behalf of God. Uh, they help God's people uh, and they carry out all God's work. I like everything else in all creation. Uh, these angels, they, they were made to worship God and so their message uh, is about God. Uh, they say uh, God is holy. Or they speak about the greatness of his, of his justice and his mercy. Or they sing of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a great and awesome saviour he is and how worthy he is of all praise. Uh, they speak of him. Now take note. Their message is first and foremost a God-centered message. They speak about him. Uh, sinners tend to focus on self. Do you know that, that happens even within the church? We spend an awful lot of time thinking and speaking about how great we are uh, or about how bad we are or, or asking as we as we read the bible what does this say about us uh, much more time devoted to that than we do to thinking about god and who he is and uh, what the bible says of him now uh, i'm aware that christians are meant to examine themselves but it's a terribly unhelpful, uh, unhealthy, dangerous thing uh, to examine yourself if you're not first looking to God. It's not safe to look at yourself unless you are already gazing obsessively at the Lord Jesus Christ and seeing in him uh, great righteousness great mercy, great salvation, great glory, unless you are looking at him, quite frankly, it's, it's not safe to look at yourself. We are to look at him first and to see the greatness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where this uh, letter now takes us. Because it tells us that uh, creation is great and prophets are great and angels are great but that Jesus Christ is infinitely greater than all these things combined because we're told his name is greater than anything else his name that is who he is essentially is greater than anything or anyone else. Uh, he, he's better because he's just better, of more value, of more worth. 
Uh, so the question that this um, letter goes on to ask and that we are going to look at now is, well, who is he? Who is he? I just want to unpack a few things that uh, this passage tells us. Uh, the writer um, quotes a lot of uh, verses from the Old Testament of the Bible and uses them to tell us who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so, first of all, uh, we're told um, he is God's son. There's a quote there in verse 5. Uh, it comes from Psalm 2, which you could read later. It would be very helpful. Psalm 2. And we're told there uh, that um, this uh, Jesus Christ, he is uh, eternally the Son of God. Uh, that he's God's Son in a very special sense. That he always has been uh, the Son of God. You know, we have father-son relationships on earth because we are mirroring God who himself is Father, Son, and Spirit. But although he is eternally the Son of God, this verse here speaks of a day uh, on which he was begotten. That is, uh, when he was brought into a, a new situation. For example, um, an unborn child... Uh, is still alive, still a child. But we take note of the day on which that child is born. And we remember that day uh, throughout that person's life. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told, eternally God's Son, here there is a day set when he is begotten. And so what is the word today in verse 5 referring to? When is that day? Well, you might guess uh, it is the day on which the Lord Jesus Christ was born into the world. But actually, um, we know when that day was because the Bible tells us. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 33, uh, tells us uh, that it is uh, the day of his resurrection that this is referring to when uh, having passed through death and risen again, he now lives forever. And uh, because of that, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 will tell us, uh, on that day, uh, he is appointed as our priest, the one who is to represent us uh, faithfully to God, having uh, sympathized with us, knowing what it's like to be one of us. Because he's come, he's become like one of us, he's died in our place, he's risen again, and today he lives forever uh, to plead our cause before God. And as you read through Psalm 2, which gives us other clues as to who this person is, uh, you find some very interesting things. For example, uh, Psalm 2 verse 6 uh, tells us that uh, this one, uh, he rules over everything forever because he has inherited his father's throne it is his throne by right oh, psalm 2 uh, verse 8 says that uh, all the earth is his inheritance it all belongs to him or psalm 2 verse 12 uh, would tell us uh, quite simply as we look at this son of god um, we can't ignore him that either you reject him and you face his anger or you come to him and honour him and you find blessing as you rest in him. But we're told in the next quote in verse 5 where it says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son that this position that he holds as the Son of God appointed in this special way, um, this is a position that he holds forever. Um, that quote is taken from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God 
uh, made a promise to David, King David, uh, that David would uh, have a descendant who would sit on the throne forever. That David would have a son who uh, himself would be God's own son and that he would reign forever. And so Jesus is, is infinitely greater uh, than anyone because he reigns forever. You see, this uh, declaration is never made uh, of angels, as great as they may be. Uh, they are great messengers of God, but uh, Jesus is God's own son. He's far greater. And so, what is his name? Who is he? He is God's son. But secondly, um, he is Lord. Uh, far from being uh, on a par with the angels, uh, in fact, the angels worship him. Jesus is their God. Uh, Jesus uh, sits on the throne of heaven and earth, uh, commanding the universe, and everything does as he says. He speaks, uh, and uh, these angels do what he says. They choose to worship him. You see, angels, these angels are, are sinless. They don't do anything wrong. And so we see clearly in their actions that uh, it is right to worship God. Why do they worship him? Uh, they worship Jesus Christ because he is Lord. And even God says of his son uh, in verse 8, uh, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. Why is Jesus so distinct, so much greater? He is Lord. You see, the angels are great servants, but Jesus is set apart. He stands above everything else as, as the one who should be served. Even angels, as great as they are, uh, they are servants. Jesus is the one uh, who should be served. And so, what a wonder it is that this Lord Jesus would step down from his throne, would come and live among us, we who should serve him and have failed to do it, that he would come and he would serve sinners by dying and, and rising uh, for them. He's Lord of all. But he came to serve me. And now, risen from the dead, sat on the throne again. He is exalted over all. What greater privilege is there for us than to serve such a wonderful Saviour? So he is God's Son. He is Lord. But then in verse 9, he is the Anointed One. Anointed means that uh, he's set apart and blessed for a particular role or purpose. And uh, in the Bible, there are three categories of people who are anointed. Prophets, priests, and kings. But Jesus is anointed as all of these. Only person in all history. Uh, he is uh, anointed, set apart, and blessed as our prophet. Uh, he declares God to us uh, fully and, and clearly and perfectly because he is God. And he's uh, anointed as our priest, uh, the one who represents us properly and uh, faithfully and completely before God. 
the one who uh, deals with our sin, set apart as that. We'll see more of that as we go through this letter. And he is anointed as our king, the one who rules over all. You see, Jesus is distinct and better and higher than anything else. Why? Uh, because no angel, no person, could ever be all that Jesus Christ is. Could ever do all that Jesus Christ has done. Now, he, he alone is, is set apart as the anointed one. But then, fourthly, uh, we see that he is set apart because he doesn't change. Verses 10 to 12, we see that he is the uh, unchanging, everlasting creator and sustainer of all things. And so in those verses, the story is laid out for us. How uh, in the beginning, uh, the Son of God made everything. He laid out the foundations of the earth. He handmade the heavens. But then we zoom forward to the end of time and we see that in the end, he will put it all away. Uh, that everything perishes and he folds it all up. Everything falls away, we're told. Uh, they will perish, uh, but he remains. Everything changes. Everything is destined for destruction, but, but he is the same. He does not fail. So we'll read later on. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Maybe as you listen to this, you're thinking, who can I trust? Can I trust powerful leaders? Uh, or impressive speakers, people who can gather all my attention. Who can I trust? Maybe you wish someone would just make it clear to you. Maybe you wish that an angel would just come from heaven and make everything clear. Uh, that they would come and, and uh, tell you how you are to live your life that they'd protect you uh, for the rest of your life, that they'd explain away all the confusion, uh, that they would solve all your problems. Or maybe you wish that would happen. Someone would just appear and make it clear. Do you know, we are far better than that. Or we uh, may not have an angel from heaven appear to us, but no, we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He has appeared. And uh, we know him. And the one who we know, the one who's, who's come near to us, he is the one who sits enthroned forever, never changing, never failing. Maybe you always feel let down. Maybe you feel at the moment like everything is just changing and it's all out of control. You don't know what to do. Maybe you feel you're changing. You see, I am so changeable. One day I'll feel very close to God. The next day I won't. One day I'll be entirely confident that I am his and that my standing before God is, is, is uh, safe and right. Uh, the next day I won't. Uh, circumstances change. People change. I change. All may change. But Jesus never Glory to his name. Who is he? Why is he so much better? Well, uh, he is the Son of God. He is Lord. 
Uh, he is the anointed, the set apart, the special one. And he is the one who, who never changes. And then finally, who is he? Well, he is the, the mighty conqueror, the one who's victorious over everything. Read uh, verse 13. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? See, he sits on the throne of heaven and earth and he's waiting. Waiting to see all his enemies overthrown. He sat down. He's confident because he knows that he's already won. Because he came and he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead so that uh, sin uh, for his people has been, has been taken away, has been punished in him, has been destroyed and dealt with and that he now lives forever. Because of that, because he's so clearly uh, conquered over everything, now he sits confident. He will reign. And forever he sits. His work has been done. He rules forever. And all will bow to him. So he sits and he waits. I wonder, as you listen to this, are you for him or against him? Because he will reign. And so we see here, the Lord Jesus Christ is set apart. He's bigger and better than anything. Uh, there's no one like him in heaven or on earth. He rules over all. But as we draw to a close, I want us to think of, of the words of, of another psalm, which tell us that um, mankind has been made a little lower than the angels, but has been crowned with glory and honour. As we summarise, let's just think about the hierarchy here. Jesus Christ rules over all. And the angels are beneath him. And we are beneath them. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come down to us has lifted us out of our terrible uh, state uh, when we could do nothing about it ourselves, has lifted us up, uh, up to heaven. And he now is crowned with glory and honour. And he crowns us with glory and honour. You see, uh, in him, sinners can be called sons. That's a privilege not even angels know. These are things, you see, that the Bible tells us uh, angels long to look into them. It's as if the angels uh, stand around, they see God's work for sinners, they look at it and they desperately long to know more of it. Because they love God. And they uh, sing of his saving love and of his greatness and his power. Uh, but they've never experienced it like I have. Like any Christian has. It's a distinctly uh, human Christian privilege to have experienced the saving love of God. You see, the angels, they see how blessed we are. And they long to know that too. Uh, there is no higher privilege than being saved by God. And of knowing God's mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, firsthand. No greater privilege. You see, the angels 
they know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Saviour. But I know him as my Saviour. What a privilege. Do you know you can know that too? If you're a Christian, you can say, I'm more blessed than anyone in all creation. More blessed even than the angels of heaven because I know Christ as my Saviour. And if you don't know that, you can just ask him. Ask him. And he'll save you. So the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he's the Son of God. He is Lord. He is the set-apart, anointed, uh, special one. He is unchanging, faithful forever. And he rules over all. What a great saviour. And what foolishness it would be to reject or to drift away from such a great saviour as the Lord Jesus Christ.